Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi But that's why we're here, isn't it? The role of women in Islam. The importance of... First of all, I'd like to see any of us actually be here without women. That's how crucial they are to us. If men gave birth... It, no, yeah, should I impose a cell phone tax for the brothers? Cell phone tax for the brothers, inshallah. That's 10, 10 pounds if I hear that again. Sisters don't have it, it's free for them, inshallah, too. <laughs> Actually, that reminds me. <laughs> I did that once in Australia, and my phone rang, and I had to actually pay my own cell phone tax. So, importance of women in Islam. Now, this is a, a topic that has been done in several different ways. Like, there's one way to do it where I could stand up and, and tell you what the women should do and what they shouldn't do. I could stand up and give you a bunch of rules. Should I do that? You want to hear the rules? These women would make the feminists cry. They were independent before they were told they were independent. Their dedication and their devotion to their creator gave them independence. They didn't have to go and wave signs and burn garments and, you know, Oprah didn't tell them they were, they were independent long before um, people could read in, in European countries. I'm going to talk about a few of those. Would that, be, would that be better than telling you rules or should I just get up here and say the women should cover their heads, the women should cook. Should I tell you that stuff? No, that's not true anyway, about the cooking part. But I want to ask you a question, because I want to see where the... Are the non-Muslims here? All right. Welcome, by the way. What do you think of when I mention Muslim women? First thing that comes into your head, what is it? Sorry? Honor. Honor, really? Okay. That's wonderful. What else? Oppressed. Oppressed? Okay. We're going to talk about those things, inshallah. Third one. Can I get a third one? Sorry? Illiterate. Illiterate. Wow, okay, I got one for that. <laughs> MashaAllah, I got a bunch for that. Because all these women were very literate. Literate, not illiterate. So we're going to try our best in the next 45 minutes to batter away those stereotypes of our um, queens and princesses, our sisters in Islam. I'm going to tell you the story of an amazing woman. First of all. This woman was mentioned in the Bible as well as the Quran. She is a woman who was the mother of Ismail, Ishmael. That's Hajar, alayhi salam, peace be upon her. Right? And she was his wife. Now some other people say she was a concubine, which is not true, according to us anyway. Some say she was a mistress, some say she was a servant. She was a maid at one point, but she became the wife of Abraham, Prophet Abraham. And he was ordered by Allah to take her to a place which was a desert. Can you imagine if your husband or your dad decides to just take you to a desert, open the car, all right, hello, <laughs> this is it. You're here by yourself with your son. Now the first question that Hajar asked her husband at the time was, is this something that Allah has ordered you to do? See, that's what, that should be always first. And these group of women, I, I like to put them in the category of putting their creator first. Because if it was the husband's order, she could protest it and she could make noise. Those women were like that back in the day. And you're going to see what Hajar actually did that changed the world. It didn't just change her situation, but it changed the whole world, even until now. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, Prophet Abraham said, this is an order from Allah. And he left her there with a pot of dates and a little bit of water. And he went on his way. Time goes by and the water is finishing and the dates are finished. They've actually finished. And Ismail, Ishmael, who was also another prophet of Allah that we, we believe in, who was actually the great-great-grandfather, well, more than that, but 
so many generations back of the last and final messenger of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and upon all the prophets that came before him, starts to get hungry, as babies tend to do, right? I got three daughters. And I, when my first daughter was born, I don't remember having a, a long period of sleep during the first three or four years of her life. They scream a lot. MashaAllah. Ismail was no different. So Haja, Haja, his mother, runs to the top of a mountain. And this mountain became a Safa, the mountain of Safa, which is in Mecca nowadays. And she doesn't see anyone, so she runs back. She runs back to the other mountain, which is Al-Marwa, and she doesn't see anyone, and she runs again. And her, can you imagine, I just want you to put yourself in that situation for a minute, because the pain that she feels of her own hunger is nothing compared to the pain of her child. And her eyes are constantly on him, but she doesn't have anyone around her, and she's going back and forth, and she doesn't know what else to do. So finally, after doing that seven times, she comes back and she sees by the by the miracle of Allah, and we believe in miracles as, as Muslims, that this baby has a pool of water under its feet. And he's kicking his feet in that water. He's like kicking. So she comes and she's you know, trying to collect this water and it keeps on coming. It keeps on coming. It's the well of Zamzam. And it's been flowing there ever since. And actually Muhammad Sallallahu said, Rahim Allah Umm Ismail. May Allah have mercy on the mother of Ismail because she tried to like, stop the water a little bit. She tried to contain it. If she didn't do that, it would have been a huge river. But instead, it was a small, it became a well. So this water saved her and her son. There were some Arab tribes in the area. And they are called Jurham. I don't know if anyone has heard of this tribe of Jurham. Jurham is coming through the area where Ismail and, and his mother are. And they stop there and they ask her a question. And she answers them with a, more, a, a, a far more amazing answer. They asked her, they said, can we stay here? They could have easily just dealt with her, isn't it? They're warrior people. They're not like, pardon me. <laughs> right? Fair lady. Could <laughs> I can't do that accent so long. They, didn't, they just asked her, could we settle here? Now she answered them, she said, yes you can, but the water belongs to us. She didn't go, oh, OMG, <laughs> LOL, who are these people? Oh my God, smiley face, right? She didn't, she said, you can stay here, but, as if she has like any power against them, but she's independent before she was told she was independent. But the water belongs to us. Now, the ritual that she did, or the thing that she did, is done by millions of people every single year in that same area. We do it. I've done it. I'm sure some people in here may have done it as well. I did mine in 2001, where I ran back and forth by those mountains, Safa and Marwa. So what she did, as an act of desperation, if she knew how her simple act, would change the modern Muslim world, the whole world. She would have strolled from Mount Safa to Marwa smiling, if she knew that. You wouldn't have Hajj today if it wasn't for her. You wouldn't have the pilgrimage if it wasn't for her. What an impact that she had on the society, and she didn't even realize it. Because she put her Creator first, and you see the gift that He's given her in this life. Everything that she did, she ran back and forth from those mountains in the well of Zamzam. We all drink from it. It's been there ever since. It's still there. The same well. So that's Hajar. And of course, you know the story of, of Ismail growing up there and it, his father came back eventually, built the Kaaba and, and so on and so forth. But that's her impact on the society. It's another story that I'm going to tell you about the mother of a prophet. Another mother of a prophet. This is the mother of Moses. Moses, we all know who Moses is, right? Muslims, non-Muslims, everyone knows who Moses is. Even atheists know who Moses is. Mentioned in the Bible, respected by the Jewish people, by the Christian people, adored by the Muslims. 
and we say peace be upon him after we say his name, alayhi salam. The Pharaoh of the day is killing all the boys. He was slaying all the boys, he was killing all of them, the boys of the children of Israel. So, Moses' mom, she got the idea from Allah that she should put her son in a basket. Can you imagine? And sending him down the, right, or the Nile River. Right? And what's Egypt today? How many of you could actually do that? You have a kid, just put the little boy in a basket and just go, okay? On your way down the river. Who picks him up? The wife of Pharaoh. She doesn't know where this boy came from and she tells her husband. Again, she, she was another one. She was actually the boss of Pharaoh at the time. Maybe we should adopt him. He could be a joy to us. Could be a joy to our eyes. Right? That's what that's what she said. The wife of Pharaoh and the mother of Moses. Of Moses. They adopt Moses, alayhi salam, Musa, and they start to raise him. Now, Musa wouldn't drink from nobody, anyone, at all. Like period, he wouldn't drink milk from any other people, any of the women of the of the Pharaoh's house or whatever. Would not drink milk from them. So the sister of Musa says, maybe I know someone who could. Again, another lady. So far we have three amazing ladies in this story. Mother of Musa, the wife of Pharaoh, and the sister of Musa. And maybe we, I know of a person who may be able to you know, feed him. She brought her mom. His mom, too. And of course, Musa said, I'm drank from his mother. Unknown to the people of that household. So what happens now? They offer her a position in the household to be the nurse of Musa. She gets to actually feed her son, and she gets paid for it. This boy eventually grows up and changes the world. Changes the world. But who was the first person to feed him? His mother. Who was the lady who adopted him? The wife of Pharaoh. Who actually eventually ended up following him. Eventually, she became one of the Muslims of those, of those days. Two amazing, three amazing ladies who had such an impact on this infant's life so that this infant could grow up and change everything. And you know the story. He's one of the highest messengers of Allah, according to the Muslims. You have another woman, Maryam. How could I give a lecture like this and not mention Mary? Peace be upon her. How could I do that? A woman who I had respect for even before I became a Muslim. Whose mother, when she was pregnant with Mary, according to Surah Al Imran, chapter 3 of the Quran, wanted to dedicate her son right, to the worship of Allah. She wanted to dedicate her son. She thought she was going to have a boy, and if she did, she would you know, make him grow up in the temple and whatnot. But a girl was given to her, and Allah knew best as to what was given to her. She grew up a little bit, and eventually she gave birth to a miraculous man. Isa, Jesus, peace be upon him. Miraculous man, one of the miraculous messengers of God. Who was born from a virgin, we believe that too. We believe that Adam had no parents, that Eve was created out of Adam, that us, we have two parents, and Jesus was born from a, a, from a woman. So that completes the cycle right there. We believe that. Who is Jesus without his mom? Without Maryam, without Mary. Who is he? We believe that she kept her chastity, and a miracle was given to her. Because she put her creator first. I have another lady. Now, this is a bit of a long story. You guys ready for this story? Or have you slept already? Everyone's quiet. Either you're ready to kill me, or you've fallen asleep, or you're enjoying the lecture. You ready for this one? Yes. Sure? Yes. All right, Wales. I've only been here. This is my first time here. Cardiff, mashallah. This story has a few amazing characters in it, but there's an amazing woman that's, that's towards the end of it. 
about a boy and a king. This king, he wants to find a magician, actually, to replace his magician that's old. Now, this magicians, you know, back in those days, magicians used to control the people, right? If they had some kind of trick they would play and people would get scared of them, kind of like the media of today, right? The media tells you we're all, Muslim sisters are all tented and staying in houses and doing nothing. When you have a whole room full of students here who are obviously literate and obviously making the most of their lives. But those, the media back then was the magician. This king's magician is getting old and his time to retire has, has, has arrived for him. So the king starts looking for an apprentice. He finds his boy. And this little boy comes out and he's the very bright. You know, you guys would call him a genius of today. As you would say. He comes out and he gets drafted by the king to become the apprentice of this man. This magician. On his way to his lesson though, he hears some of the followers of Jesus. You know, the, before, um, before Christianity came into existence, they were the followers of Jesus. They were Muslims at the time. And he starts hearing them. And they're preaching. He goes in and he's captivated by them. Something about them just kind of interested him, made him interested. He's listening to one of their priests. And what he, what he used to do is he would go to those people and then he would go to the magician to learn. And he was always late for the magician. So the magician would beat him up. You can't do that today, you go to jail. <laughs> so the magician would beat him up. And then he would go home, and on his way home, he would stop and listen to these people again. And he'd be late for his family, and his family would beat him up. What's that Irish family, you think? <laughs> he'd beat up every day by somebody. So eventually he asked the priest, and he says, listen, every day, someone's beating me up. I'm late for the magician, he beats me up, late for my family, they beat me up. What should I do? He said, when you go to the magician, tell him that your family delayed you. And when you come back home to your family, tell them that the magician delayed you. So that worked pretty well and he stopped getting beaten up. She would have talked to me about my mom. <laughs> You'll hear that story tomorrow, inshallah. And so on. Time goes by and there's an animal in the, in the kingdom. I'm trying to make the story short as possible because it is about the ladies and I want to keep it as a focus for them. And um, eventually, what ends up happening is that this nation becomes Muslim. All of them, under this boy. So the king, he has a problem with that. And I'm, again, I'm shortening the story, but he has a problem with that and he threatens to burn them all if they don't abandon their faith. So he starts doing that. It's a, it's a very graphic story. He digs a, a big trench and he's throwing people in it and his soldiers are throwing people in it. And there's this amazing woman who comes with her child. And the baby, as a miracle, speaks from that, from that woman. Because she hesitates, as you would. We wouldn't even have been there. <laughs> we would have just went to Wales. Right? We would have just left. We wouldn't even have been in a place like that. We'd claim our refugee status and just take a walk somewhere and leave. They couldn't do that, so this lady, she came up and she was hesitating. And the baby spoke to her and he said, Asbidi Yabni, be patient, oh my mom, because you are on the truth and you're practicing the truth. And she was patient and she was actually martyred. Now, you would think that a gruesome story to happen to somebody. All these people died. That's not... A very nice story, is it? But this lady, eventually the Quran was revealed and her story was in that Quran. The people, those people who were burned to death. Their story was in the Quran and that's how we're able to tell it today because this strong, amazing woman put her creator first. And behind that punishment, as it looked like, was paradise for them. Now, no one's asking you to do that, obviously. We're not killing anyone. All right. Despite what uh, BBC says or anyone else, we're not killing anybody. <laughs> we're not asking you to burn at all. So don't you know, worry about that. But that's the story of a woman who was faced with a tremendous trial. And she was able to overcome that trial with her patience. Aisha. Aisha, mashallah. What do you guys know about Aisha? Sorry. Who was Aisha? Anyone know? This is interactive, you know, you don't have to just like sit there. 
Don't raise your hands either, because I can't see you. <laughs> Who's Aisha? Shout it out, Wales. Come on. Wife of the Prophet. Yes, brother, mashallah. Wife of the Prophet. You know the Orientalists have an issue with her, isn't it? Your prophet married a nine-year-old girl, yeah? <laughs> if I was in Ireland, it would be, Your prophet married a nine-year-old girl, so I did. Like, <laughs> right? If I was in India, it would be, Your prophet. <laughs> That's an interesting story. And, I, and I'm, I actually love it when people ask about that. Because a lot of people... They don't like to see people abused. And that's fabulous. I don't like to see that either. But where did that story come from? Does anyone know where that story came from? Came from the girl. It wasn't written by anybody else. The story of Aisha's marriage to Muhammad, peace be upon him, came from her. So should we accept her as being truthful or not? We should, right? Yeah. Entirely or unentirely? Entirely. Well, she also said, until the day she died, that he's the messenger of Allah. If we're going to believe her, then we have to believe everything she said. Otherwise, how do you know how old she was when she got married? So let's talk about this marriage. Marriage. Marriage, marriage. Did I say marriage? Marriage. I didn't say concubine. I didn't say that. I said wife. She was what? How old was she? Let's talk about it. I mean, let's be honest. She was nine. That's what the hadith says. Let's go with that. Since we're taking her as being truthful, let's talk about that for a second. This is a question I love to get. She was what? Approached. Approached. Not forced, not kidnapped, not grabbed in the middle of the night, choked out, brought to a tent and said, Here, husband, you go. <laughs> she was, what? Approached. By who? Her father. Her dad. Came and said that the Messenger of Allah wants to be married, married to you. And she agreed at that age. Now Aisha, you have to know something about Aisha, first of all. Aisha was a scholar of genealogy. She was a scholar of the Arabic language. She was a poet. She taught men into her 70s when she died. She was a scholar of her time and she was a very quick study. You would not know about the issue of cleanliness in Islam if it wasn't for her. So she wasn't your little you know, iPod playing, chewing gum, kid. Because when you picture someone, you picture like little ponytails and, you know, Dora the Explorer and stuff. <laughs> right? And I mean, you should. Nowadays, I, I, fully, I don't agree with that. That happens in a lot of countries and it's terrible. That um, child brides are, for, that's horrible. We're not talking about that. We're talking about Aisha. Let's keep it very simple. Because this story wouldn't, have, wouldn't even have happened if it wasn't for Aisha. So Aisha agrees to marry. Mary. Prophet agrees. Can you imagine? Agrees. Not forced, not kidnapped, not choked out, not taken in the middle of the night. Brought, you know the story. <laughs> I'll say it again. Time goes by and she describes her marriage to this, this man, Muhammad. How he used to let her drink from, the, from a cup. And he would find the place where her mouth was, and he would drink from that place. Brothers, ew! <laughs> you don't do that, right? Brothers, ah, no, you got cooties or something. <laughs> you know, you're all nice during the time before marriage. You don't want to drink from her now, right? He used to drink from her. So I said, he used to find the place where her teeth had bitten into the food, and he would bite there. He would run races with her. One time he beat her, one time she, you know, she beat him. She describes her marriage to him. She describes when he used to put her head in, his head in her lap and read the Quran. You don't do that now, you brothers. <laughs> right? You're ready to watch the World Cup, though. 
he describes this, she describes this marriage that when he died, he wanted to die with her. He wanted to have, he wanted to be in her arms when he died. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the messenger of Allah and his, one of his very best friends. It's not about abuse. It's not about some distorted relationship. This is from the girl herself who lived long after he died. She could have left. She could have ran away. She could have just said no. Even long after he passed away, she taught people and she taught men about cleanliness and about um, the Arabic language and about genealogies and about all these different things that she had learned over the years. Aisha was an amazing woman. So was this a marriage of abuse? Absolutely not. There are many that are going on today and we should not be naive enough to say they don't exist because they do. And it's disgusting. But this was not one of them. Aisha was an amazing genius of her time. And this is her story. And if we want to take that story, we should take it all. People may not agree with it and that's fine, but this is the story. Don't be fooled by the Orientalists that just give you this very basic... They don't even tell you where they've gotten that story from. Most of them that I have asked don't even know where they... Well, my preacher told me that. That's what they say. Oh, my teach my... Stu Biology teacher told me that. My dad told me, someone told me that. They don't even read it by themselves. But you want to point fingers at the most amazing man that ever lived and one of the most amazing women that ever lived. Our mother Aisha. You want to talk about a lady named Um Ayman. Who, who is she? Do you, anyone know? Who is Um Ayman? The mother of Ayman. Do you know who she was? Anyone brother laughing back there? You all know that. You all too busy tweeting or something mad. Um Ayman was a lady who adopted Muhammad Sallallahu when he was a baby. His mom passed away and Um Ayman was the one who adopted him. So she watched that young boy grow up into a man, into one of the most revered men of the Arabs even before he received prophethood at the age of 40. She watched the message of Muhammad Sallallahu grow. She watched his difficulty. She watched his triumphs. She followed him eventually. And when he died, she was crying. Now the companions, they came to her and they said, Why are you crying? You know what's waiting for him. She said, I'm not crying because of the loss of my son. Now many of you guys would just start like wailing. Some women wail when people die. You don't even know them, you just wail. My cousin did that when my grandfather passed. He wailed, screamed. I didn't even know she could scream that loud. <laughs> this lady was crying not because of the loss of her son, but because the revelation had stopped. That was it. It was cut off. This is the last and final message. And that was the end of it when Muhammad passed away. That's Um Ayman. You have another lady who I know personally. Met her a few years ago when I was in Africa, I was in Kenya. She would come to my uh, house. She worked not far from where I lived at the time. She would come to me and I would be dressed up like this, right? <laughs> this is an act of worship, but this is a fashion statement. So <laughs> I would walk through Africa like this. I would look. Because and, and there was some wisdom behind that. Because if I walked through in like European clothes, the, the people would charge me more for things. <laughs> so I dressed like an Arab and I got things for cheap. So that was, that was the deal. That's terrible. Isn't that terrible? So, where are you more Arab, right? You're an Arab. That's what they would say. And I would say, no, not really, but mashallah. They wouldn't believe me because what white guy dresses like I do? Must be Irish, in fact. So I met this lady, she asked me about Islam, you know, here and there, she'd come to my house and say, who do the Muslims pray to? And I would tell her, we pray to one creator who is unique in his oneness, has no partners and is incomparable to his creation, meaning there's nothing like him. And she seemed to like that, she came back and she asked about the prophets and told her about the prophets, 
that they were sent here to teach us how to behave towards each other and how to worship our Creator. She came back, she asked me about our Prophet Muhammad, the last and final messenger, وسلم. I told her a little bit about him and she accepted Islam. She became Muslim. Our family doesn't like that very much. This is Africa, it's not the UK. You know, UK you can go and you can get like on the dole and stuff, no worries. Canada too, your family kicks you out, you get a government house, no, no problem. You have a nice house and they do in some cases. But TIA, brother, this is Africa. She, family says to her, either you leave this Islam of yours, or you leave the house. She left the house. In Africa. No net. And this is a modern woman. This is not like someone who lived, you know, 1500 years ago. This is a modern woman. Who knew she was independent before she was told it. She finds a little place to stay, and I'm still in contact with her because she has no one else. Still, I call and check for her. She's like, you know, Muskeen, you know, mashallah, the sister's really struggling. Eventually, I actually married that sister. Why? You know why? Because you fell in love. So, sala pehele. Because you fell in love. No, not really. I mean, eventually, yeah, that was the case. But I wanted to be like her. I wanted to be like that. I wanted to have that patience. And I wanted to have that surety, that yaqeen is in Arabic, this certainty. Because you have to have certainty to do stuff like that. You can't just do that. Say, so, you know, just be patient. Hide. She didn't do that. I'm, I mean, like that's not for everyone, you know. Some people have, everyone has different circumstances. But I was so envious, I wanted to be just like her. So I said, well, I should just marry her then, inshallah. <laughs> I could be like her. And I learned patience from her. And this job requires a lot of patience. A lot. She's my backbone. And don't get upset that the backbone is behind you. You're, you couldn't walk without your backbone. Behind doesn't necessarily mean bad. This is another stereotype. They keep their women behind them. Your backbone is behind you too and I'd like to see you walk without it. <laughs> behind doesn't mean bad. That's, that's a ridiculous statement. That's silly, in fact. You know, the, when, you, when you have a boat, where's the motor? I don't even have boats in <laughs> It's in the back. Man, you guys are tough. MashaAllah. You guys are used to the speaker that gets up and just talks to you for an hour. You don't even have to do nothing. You're on cue. When I say salam alaikum again, you're gone. <laughs> I don't work that way, in case you haven't noticed already. Just because someone is behind doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. This sister is my backbone. The women that I mentioned to you were the backbones of their society. Hajar was the backbone of Ismail. Uh, Aisha was one of the backbones of Muhammad Sallallahu Right? Maryam was the backbone of Jesus. And we don't believe that he was disrespectful to his mother. There's a verse in the Bible that says, Oh woman, we don't believe that at all. We'd never address her like that. Khadija was another one. She was a businesswoman. She was also the first wife of Muhammad Sallallahu She was his backbone. Actually, he worked for her. These are women that lived in the 7th century, with the exception of my wife, of course. <laughs> She's not that old. <laughs> She's younger than me, in fact. But that's the thing, like this is the... Hafsa was another lady. You know the Qur'an when it was put into a book form? It was the only one in the world. It wasn't given to the president, or the king, or the khalifa. It was given to one of the daughters of the Khalifa, which her, her name was Hafsa. She was given it as a trustworthy. There was another lady whose name was Hafsa bin Sirin. I don't know if you know who Muhammad bin Sirin is. He was a scholar. But Hafsa was one of the women he would go to when he didn't know something. These are amazing people. And we actually, even the men, neglect to learn about them. 
They built mosques and they traveled to different countries and they owned businesses and they fought in the battles. Oh yes. Who knows about Nusayba bint Kaab? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> you realize you raise your hand to someone that can't see, right? Nusayba was a woman from Medina, which is the city of our Prophet. And she was bringing water to one of the battles that he was fighting against. People were attacking them and he was fighting against them. It was the Battle of Uhud, right? Very famous of one of the battles of his, of his life. So she was bringing water to the companions. And they were, they were getting beaten up, actually. They were losing at the time. So many of them were running away. They were leaving. So she started fighting with her hands, like beating the men. Can you imagine? Like that. Pow! You know? Probably better than that. That was a horrible uppercut. But she, like, she, she was fighting the men. Sisters. OMG, <laughs> LOL, All right. TTFN, TTYL, you would tweet the battle, oh, they're really getting beaten, oh, S sad face, <laughs> colon left parenthesis, right, they're really getting beaten, not her, Yuseba, Yuseba started to fight, so the prophet ordered one of the soldiers to give Nusayba his sword and shield. And she fought. She actually fought in the army. When was this? This last year. 1400 years ago. 14 centuries ago, there was a woman soldier who fought. And her son fought, and her son had gotten hurt in the battle. He had his leg kind of chopped like his leg. So she patched up her son. What did she do? And she go, Berta, are choro, Berta, don't fight, don't fight anymore, Berta. Did she say that? Cook him ladu. <laughs> what did she say? Go back, man, you're all right. Go back and fight. And she actually caught the man that hurt her son, and she chopped his leg. And he fell, and she held the sword to his throat, and Muhammad told her, told her to leave him alone. He said, you've avenged yourself, like that. She fought in many battles. And she was what? A woman. Sister, she's one of you. He said about her, wherever I looked, I saw her fighting. Wherever I looked, she was protecting me. She's a warrior. She was a warrior before warriors were cool. She was a warrior. All right. That's, that, that's Nusayba in Tkab, another amazing woman, incredible woman. There's another woman that I met. Don't worry, I only got one wife. <laughs> hey. There was another woman that I met in Toronto, Canada, 1996. Well, I came to that place to work. And I met this sister. I was amazed, actually, because of how articulate she was, how she used to... You know, some people demand respect. You know that. They don't have to get up and yell and scream and shout and order you to respect them. They just demand respect by their behavior, by their demeanor. She was like that. This was one of the first... Actually, yeah, it was the first Muslim that I ever met in my life. And that was the lady who eventually helped me enter Islam. I entered Islam through a sister. <coughs> I'm very proud of that as well. So I've been surrounded by Muslim sisters in my house. I married a sister. My ex-wife is a Muslim sister. I got three daughters. The one who took my shahada is a sister. I've been surrounded by women since I entered Islam, inshallah, in a good way. So their impact has had a huge effect on my life, and it has had a huge effect on the lives of the, of the people that came before, during their... Guess what? I don't like to guess. <laughs> what? 
10 minutes. 10 minutes! Alright, Unless, of course, you guys want to go for longer. Yeah. 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 yeah? Well, I only got about 10 minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can do the questions and answers, inshallah, after that. But these are some amazing people. Now I want to ask you guys a question. After hearing that, and this is for the non Muslims. Muslims, you guys can answer if, if they're quiet, inshallah. Now, what is your perception of the Muslim woman? After hearing about these people, in brief, what is it now? Okay, they're quiet. <laughs> Sisters, what's your opinion of them now? It's probably your opinion anyway, but what, was, what, is your, what would you say about them now? Did I beat those stereotypes? Yes. Of curtained women who just live behind these face masks and don't talk to anybody and you know, take abuse from everyone. I mean, there are women like that and I'm not making light of it. This is because some of the Muslims have no idea the gift that they've been given once they've been given a wife. They have no idea. But that has nothing to do with our faith. This is so far away from our faith that it's unbelievable. Because we are ordered to be kind to our, our women, our wives and our daughters. Muhammad said, I'm the best. You, the best of you are the ones who are good to their families, their wives. He used to put food into his wife's mouth by his hand, can you imagine? This is a leader. Takes food like that and puts it in his wife's mouth. You do that now. Brothers will laugh at you. Some men do not realize the gift that they've been given. That's why they're bad to their wives. They know absolutely nothing about the status of women in Islam and they know nothing about their amazing role model sisters that came before. I didn't come up here to talk to you about hijab. You already hear that all the time. All of the sister, you have to cover your head completely. You hear that all the time. I don't want to tell you that again. Do you need to hear that again? I want to give you some shining examples of femininity. Nuseiba, there isn't a feminist on earth that could match her. I'm sorry, not one, not ten. Nuseiba is amazing. Someone outside doesn't like to talk. <laughs> I don't care. Who's, who's more narrow-minded, the one who doesn't listen or the one who actually listens? Right? If there's issues, inshallah, we can take care of the issues, inshallah, later. In a peaceful way, in a peaceful way. <laughs> no one shall be killed, inshallah. <laughs> but these women were amazing. Khadija, businesswoman, had businesses before. Do you know what they used to argue in like the late 18th century? They used to argue if women had souls or not. Does a woman have a... Are you serious? And if she does, is it the soul of a person or the soul of an animal? That was a legit argument back in the day, back a little more than a hundred years ago. While our women were fighting wars and teaching men, other women were... Subjugated. Why is it when you see a, 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 a habit on a nun? And I like the nuns. Personally, I think they're fabulous. Why do you think devoted? When you see a Muslima with a hijab, why do you think oppressed? And again, there are women who are oppressed. And this is a cultural oppression. There's no honor in killing innocent people. There's no such thing as honor killing in Islam. They may have it in certain countries, unfortunately, and we hope that it stops one day. And as long as I'm alive, I'm going to do my best to make sure that it stops, inshallah. We don't have that in our faith. This issue of women being tented behind face masks is not from our faith. They were proactive women who built mosques. Can you imagine? They actually built mosques and funded mosques to be built. 
They owned businesses. They taught men. So what is the status of women in Islam? They have a priceless status. They're priceless. Their brains are much more important than their beauty. They decorate the outsides of their head and they decorate the inside of it as well. Because they're knowledgeable, they are our mothers, they are our daughters, they are our sisters, they are our life. We love them and respect them and we should be honoring them. And if not, <laughs> there should be brothers who are ready to do something about that. That's my time. Jazakumullah khairan. Yaqulullah li hada. Astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.